Welcome to Be Enriched, a Learn at Home project produced by the Wellness Institute of Greater Buffalo in cooperation with the Buffalo Public Schools and hosted by Buffalo Public School teachers. Your host for today's virtual field trip is Michelle Augusto, Director of Arts for the Buffalo School System. Now please join Michelle as she travels to fun and educational destinations throughout Western New York. Hello, BPS family. Welcome to Be Enriched, a televised field trip program just for you. I'm Michelle Agosto, and I'm the Director of Arts for the Buffalo Public Schools, and I'm so excited to have you here with me. We, or, we happen to be at the beautiful Marcy Casino, mm -hmm. located near um, Hoyt Lake yes. at Delaware Park, yes. and um, we want to talk a lot about Olmsted, Olmsted Parks, and the amazing um, architect and designer that he was, and the park that he's really gifted Buffalo. Yes, we like to say that the park system here is the gift that keeps on giving. Yes, it yes. is. <laughs> <laughs> I also heard it's also, you know, we're called the City of Lights, but it's also called the City of Trees. The City of Trees, that's right. Why we is have, that? We have thousands of trees in this community, and tens of thousands of them are here in the Olmsted Park System, and we're very lucky to have a strong forestry department that's caring for those trees, making sure that they are growing, they're healthy, and they're gonna be here for generations to come. Trees are so important to the quality of life of our community. So if you can give um, some of our young people who are watching an idea what a thousand trees looks like, how much would that fill up? Can you imagine what kind of space it would fill up? It would up? fill up a lot of space, <laughs> a lot of space. And just think about the number of leaves of a thousand full grown trees and the environmental impact of those trees. It's just amazing. Not only does it support the quality of air that we breathe every day, but it also is just so peaceful to sit and listen to trees and the leaves and the wind. Um, and that's really what Olmsted valued. He truly believed in the power of nature for physical wellness, for your mental wellness, and especially when we're going through what our community is going through now with a pandemic, it's so important to have access to trees and green space. So we really are lucky in this community to have the parks and the park system that we have here today. Yeah, I love how you connected that because walking, even just walking by, it's very meditative. It is, it really is. And, and the Conservancy is proud to be able to offer benches and space for running, um, space for walking. There's trails that are available that are a little bit more wooded. Um, there's this beautiful lake here, so you can come and sit by the water. There's really something for everybody here in the Olmsted system. So Olmsted, you know, I, I know that um, this particular Olmsted Park system is on the National Registry it for Historic is, Places. It is, it is, yes. Really, that's a really big deal, right? It's a huge deal. <laughs> it's a huge deal. It's a long application process, um, and it just elevates the status of the system that we have here in Buffalo. Um, Delaware Park is also an international award winner for public spaces. Um, the Guardian awarded it the best public space in the world a few years ago. I know, right? Right here in Buffalo, <laughs> isn't that so cool? It is amazing. It's, yeah. it's like a, it's like your own. I don't know. It's like a gem. It you is know, that we need to take advantage of. It is. I know Frederick Law Olmsted said um, he, he. There's a statement or a quote mm -hmm. on the website that a park is a work of art, yes. and you know I'm the director of arts. So yes. I'd like you to talk a little bit about that. What What do you think he meant by that? Sure. So, Olmsted is the father of American landscape architect, or landscape architecture, and he truly believed, I mean, when he was a child, his father used to take him out into nature to heal. Um, his mother died at a very young age. Um, he became interested in the human experience and how nature could help improve the human experience. And for him, this was a, developing these parks was a lifelong passion. And he truly believed that they should be beautiful, they should be accessible, um, there should be something special and secretive about them. So as you're walking around the trails, you'll see you know, something that you maybe didn't see from uh, several feet or yards back. Um, so for him, this was, his, the land was his canvas and He's developed these works of art um, all across the country, but we're really lucky to have the park system here in Buffalo. Yeah, yeah we are. I agree yeah. with you fully on that. Yeah. So I know that this is not the only park mm -hmm. that 
um, makes up this Olmstead um, design or the mm -hmm. Olmstead Park system. Yes. Can you um, tell us a few other spots that we can enjoy at Absol Olmstead Park? Absolutely. So what's really special about the park system here in Buffalo is that it touches every single community here. So we have parks here on the northern part of Buffalo. There's MLK Junior Park on the east side. Yes. There's Riverside and Front Park on the west side. And then there's South Park and Casanova Park in the South Buffalo. And Olmstead's original plan had all all of those park spaces connected by parkways and circles. Oh, wow. So many of the parkways that we're familiar with today, Bidwell, Chapin, Lincoln, for example, um, those are some of the most popular. That really shows the connectivity of his system. Um, and then many of the circles, like Colonial Circle and McClellan and McKinley Circle down in South Buffalo, those are some of the examples of Olmstead circles. So he really, he came to Buffalo and was passionate about the interconnectedness of our community and wanted to enhance that by putting parks within a city. So he wanted people to be able to visit one park and then travel in a parkway to another park and never leave nature. So that. there's parks everywhere for kids and families to take advantage of and we really encourage them to get outside um, you know safely of course now and just take advantage of the green space that we have here. Yeah I love that so much. So um, what can you share maybe one special secret or something that they may not know is actually in an Olmstead Park. Sure. Oh my gosh. There's so <laughs> many. So, okay, I have a couple. Many people don't realize that um, many of the cultural institutions are actually located in the Olmstead system. Oh. Eight of our cultural institutions are home, they find their home here in the Olmstead system and we're really proud to be able to provide that curb appeal to them. Um, some other really special spots. Um, the Japanese Garden oh, over yes. by the History Museum is a beautiful spot. Um, MLK has the Splash Pad, which is a really fun space for kids. Right. Um, the Ivy Bridge here in Delaware Park is one of Olmstead's original design, um, one of his bridges, his pedestrian bridges. That's a beautiful place to go and walk and have a, a meditative experience. Oh, so I that's more than one. Yeah, that's more than one, and I know there are more. <laughs> there, are there are more. more. There are. So, Katie, thank you so much for sharing everything that you know about Olmstead Park. Oh, I'm and, happy to. And I know our, our young people are going to love it. Oh, I hope so. I hope so. We hope to see them all out in the park this summer. Okay, thank all you. Right, thank you. And we're here now with Megan Dye, and she is the director of Tift Nature Preserve. And thank you so much, Megan, for being with us. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah, I'm so excited. So, you know, we've just talked a little bit about Olmstead, mm -hmm. and we are so lucky here in Buffalo to have so many opportunities to enjoy nature. Definitely. And Tiff Nature Preserves is, is just one of them. It's yeah. another big one, and I know a lot of our young people visit there. Yes, they do. You know, for field trips. So I, I, I know it's 264 acres. Mm -hmm. That's big. It is big. Why would one find there like if they if our young people went on a field trip or went with their families what would they discover there so I say the best thing to do as soon as you arrive is just take a minute to stop listen and look around make sure that you take time to really look and stop you know stop and smell the roses yes. <laughs> is a, a great saying and it's definitely true at Tift although we don't have roses there's lots to stop and look at and you don't want to overlook even the smallest things. What is nice about Tift is there are many different kinds of wildlife. We see um, anywhere from 160 to 180 or even more species of birds in here and some of them are very friendly and easy to spot real close by in the trees. But we have this time of year frogs and turtles and there's always deer to see. Um, you may get lucky and see a groundhog. There's one that lives right around the center and sometimes <laughs> <laughs> makes an appearance running across the driveway or even on the deck of the center. Um, it's just a wonderful place to visit um, and to see some local wildlife. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. So you have fauna mm -hmm. and flora, yes. right? Can you explain what those two things are? Sure. Okay. So fauna refers to animals. So I mentioned a whole list of animals and I overlooked the flora, which is really important. Those animals need something to eat, right? And many of them or our food chains and our food webs always start with the sun and plants, those that are producing food. And so flora are all of the plants and we definitely can't overlook those. Tift has a little bit of a problem with some plants, 
we have many of what are called invasive species and invasive and they, they like to take over and they like to grow and grow and grow and some of them are ones that we don't want there. So sometimes, like right now, you'll come to Tift and see an area that had plenty of plants and they're gone, they've been cut down and people get upset by that. They think a nature preserve should just be all green but what we're doing is we're taking away those plants that aren't as good and don't provide as much for the animals that are there and replacing them with really good plants. Oh yeah, that would be helpful to them because mm -hmm. there are certain animals and plants that are that are um, born and raised right here in Buffalo. Yep. They're um, indigenous, yes. right, to the to the area. But then there are some that come somehow mm -hmm. they visit through all sorts of means, yeah. and then they find their home here, and they're not really welcome. Right. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about the really kind of surprising things that you would see? at TIFF preserves? So one of the things is, although the animals are wild animals, like I mentioned, some of them will get sort of close. And we have to remember they are wild animals. Um, so it's not like a zoo or a farm. Um, and we don't care for the animals that are there. They're on their own with the food. We might put up a bird feeder here or there, but those animals are really in charge of finding their own food. Um, one of the things that I just think is great and a great story and easy to see this time of year at Tift is we have a species of bird called an osprey, similar to a bald eagle, a very large bird, a raptor, a bird of prey. Wow. So they eat other animals oh, and boy. they nest right along the shore of Lake Kersey. And that's something that we wouldn't have seen 20 years ago. Um, so and that um, nest is now available to watch online as well throughout the spring and summer. You can go to YouTube and actually watch what's going on in the nest. This year they had three offspring or fledglings who just a few weeks ago learned to fly and took off from the nest Aww. and now they're fishing. They eat a lot of fish. They are fishing on their own. Oh, that's really exciting. So it brings me to like the history of TIFF preserves. Mm -hmm. It was called TIFF Farms yep. and before that it was purchased for a different reason yeah. and, it, and I want you to talk about that but it's just it's really fascinating to see that the repurposing of the land has really saved several species and has allowed it to grow so can you yeah. talk about the history sure okay. so when you come to visit Tift one of the probably last things you will see is our cattail marsh and had you visited Tift 300 years ago that's all Tift would have been was cattail marsh um, and over the years it had many different uses and and there are signs of each of those uses if you know where to look, but they're not very obvious. So the lake that is um, right next to the parking lot and our environmental education center is called Lake Kirsty now. That was originally dug as shipping canals and some of the trails that you go on were actually once railroads. Um, the Tift name, as you said, um, it was once called Tift Farm and we really shy away from that. Yeah. We know Buffalo likes their names and a lot of people <laughs> still call it Tift Farm. Um, but that suggests that we have cows and pigs and right. chickens, which we don't. The, again, they're wild animals. So, um, But it was used by the Tift family as a dairy farm for many years. Um, and right before becoming a nature preserve, what is now our mounds, that's actually garbage. It was the city dump and landfill. And I think it's important for the students to realize, especially with some of the things that are going on in our community right now and around the world, is that when people come together and they're passionate passionate about something, they can make real change, yes. right? And that is exactly how Tift became a nature preserve. People saw the marsh and they saw the birds that were coming in there, they saw the habitat that was around and they were upset by garbage being dumped there. And so they banded together and they encouraged the city to turn it into a nature preserve instead of a dump. Yeah, I love that story so much and it is about advocacy. And mm -hmm. I think that's something that we really need to teach our children yes. to do, advocate for what you believe. So. It's true. So thank you, Megan, so much for thank being you. With, with us. I appreciate your time. I, I can't wait to go back to Tiff Farm. Great. Tiff Nature you Preserve. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And now I'd like to welcome one of our guests from Friends of Broderick Park. This is George Johnson, and he's the president of Buffalo United Fronts, but he's also one of the lead community organizers for Friends of Broderick Park. And so thank you, George, for coming on with us. Well, thank you. I'm my pleasure of being here. I'm glad to be able to come and um, do whatever is necessary for this conversation. Yes. So, so George. Talk a little bit about um, Friends of Broderick Park and why, I know at 
maybe about 10 years ago or so, right. there was an organization, it kind of died out, and then you decided to reconvene. Right. Right. Can you tell me why? Well, what happened was uh, when we originally started the Friends of Broderick Park, uh, which was uh, some years ago, about 10, 12 years ago, and that was to put uh, some stakeholders together that have an interest in the park to have the park redone. Um, standing on the shoulders of other people that came before us for uh, the park in itself. The park has such a, a great significance in our community. Uh, we just came and tried to help do what was necessary to get the park redone. So we did that and I think it was an investment of about maybe three, three four million dollars to redo the park. But after that, that uh, phase of the park was done, um, I think things kind of got stalemated because there was no other activities going on at that particular time, at least for about two, three years. So there was a lot of uh, concern uh, in terms of a lot of people that was continue to use the park, uh, anglers and other different people that, that, that had different events that was going on in the park. By me being one of the original people that was part of the Friends of Bradley Park, uh, having discussion with some other uh, stakeholders, uh, they were interested in reconvening the Friends of Product Park and to take things to the next level of finishing some things that wasn't wasn't done at uh, uh, at that particular time. So it was like two, three years where um, hadn't anything continued being done from that point. So we reconvened and say, well, let's come back and let's try to complete or continue this this effort on in terms of trying to get some things done. So Broderick Park, it's it's it is a beautiful park, and what um, the yes. friends of Broderick Park has, have done to advocate for it is amazing. Right. It's right at the foot of Ferry, right? And you can see the Peace Bridge right. from that spot. Right. Can you talk? Because we're talking to a lot of young people through this okay. show. Okay. So can you talk about why it was so important for you and for friends of Broderick Park to make sure Broderick Park became a place where it was safe because there's a lot of history to that right. spot well one of the main reasons why we we wanted to um, reconvene and to continue was because the educational piece in terms of the significance of the park in itself uh, broderick park actually slash we underground railroad so underground railroad is very significant in terms of the slavery trying to teach our young people as much as possible in terms of the history of um, why Broderick Park is there and why it was called the Underground Railroad. Um, um, actually that river, a lot of people think that it's a fishing park because there's a lot of anglers that go down there and you know they do their fishing and things of this nature. But in terms of, of uh, a lot of the significance of the Underground Railroad in itself, it's very sacred ground because mm -hmm. those uh, that's, that's the place where a lot of our ancestors tried to cross over to Canada mm -hmm. to become free. Mm -hmm. So um, we try to teach our young people as much as possible in terms of um, what actually the Underground Railroad mean. Uh, um, I've, I've just, just this past June, we had the um, Juneteenth, uh, which is the freedom of the slaves, things of this nature. So, we need to educate them and let them know exactly what's going on with all of those different things that the history. And we're only standing on the shoulders of those people that came before us to continue to um, highlight those different things that's significant in the history of where we come from. Yes, and that's really important for oh, our, very, very our, much so. yeah, our very children much so. to understand where right. we, we come from and right. the importance right. of that location. Right. But you're right, it is a very solemn place, but there's also a lot of happiness that um, oh, you have, definitely. yeah, that you have brought there, yeah. and I'd like for you to talk a little bit about the fishing day that you've yeah. you've been able we, to do. We every June we have um, uh, what we call family fishing day, and what it is is that uh, every June, the free day of the free day of um, through the state uh, that you you're not um, you you don't have to have a fishing license. So we decided, me and a few of the anglers that down there fishing, we decided, well, this is a good way to. Uh, bring some young people to the water, teach them how to fish. But what it does, more importantly, is open up conversation. It opens up uh, a dialogue to be able to have uh, some type of communication with some of the younger, especially teenagers. And then 
The other part of that is bringing families together to see how uh, how significant for them to spend time together, show them different things about the park, show them different things about uh, um, um, the slavery, things of this nature. And, and sometimes we do uh, um, uh, open up a conversation for people that's going through a lot of different problems. Mm -hmm. We have people that uh, we can direct them to, to teach them or to show them direction on different things they may be having problems with. Um, more importantly, it, it, it really opened up a dialogue, especially for the, the, the bad kids that uh, don't normally talk about different things, but you stand there and you're teaching a young kid how to fish, and he began to talk about everything, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> because oftentimes we always talk to them, but we very seldom get a chance to listen to them. So, and, and that's part of the, the reason why we started the fi Family Fishing Day. And then it's ongoing. After we teach them how to fish, we continue during the course of um, the, the, the summer or whatever, and we take them other places to fish, things of this nature. And then we continue to meet them down in the park, give them a chance to go around the park, see a lot of different things that's happening and why um, it's necessary to know about the park itself. Yes. So I know that you're there and yeah. the group is there yeah. every Saturday. Every from Saturday 10 from 10 to 12, we go down and we spruce the park up. Lillian Bachelor's Garden is a very significant part of that park and it's it's a place of meditation you can go down there and it's so beautiful in terms of the flowers and all of the different things that's down there and sometimes you just go there and sit and you sit right there by the water and it's just so beautiful and yes. peaceful yes that uh it, it it is very helpful thank you george thank you all right all right okay so now we're here with our friend from the buffalo niagara water keeper this is Chris Murawski, and he's a director of community engagement. And thanks, Chris, for coming. Thanks so much for having me. It's my pleasure. So I'm really glad that we had George before you because it was a perfect lead in to what you do at Buffalo Niagara Waterkeeper. And I know that um, it's been about 30 years in, exi in existence, the Buffalo Niagara Waterkeeper. And I was reading a little bit about the organization and I love there are four words that are used in your mission, right? And that just tells people what exactly you want to do as part of the organization. And you use the words protect, restore, connect, and inspire. Can you tell our young people why those words are so important for the Buffalo Niagara Waterkeeper? Sure. So um, water is really important and it's the basically like the unifying thing that connects all of us together. We all need water and water is life. Our bodies are 60% water and our brains are 80% water. Yeah. So we need it to survive and we need to protect it. So we protect our water bodies uh, from new pollution getting into them. And then we restore our water bodies because we've had a long history of industry here in our area. So there was a lot of bad chemicals and things from manufacturing that are in our water. So we need to restore the waterways. We also need to restore the land that's next to the waterways. Mm -hmm. And and then we, we want to connect people to water. So we connect volunteers, community members you know, to get involved and help us in our mission of protecting the waterways and also to enjoy, you know, get out and enjoy the waterways. And then we hope to inspire community engagement and inspire people to help us with our mission um, because you know we have such a special place here with with our water yeah so you're involved in lots of different projects that deal with the water ways and the systems um, and you have a lot of people that help you with this and i think you have almost three thousand uh, volunteers that help yep. you with all these different types of projects and programs can you talk about why you think so many people want to help restore, protect, connect, and, ins and inspire others about the water? Sure. Um, like when we think about a lot of the big problems that we have in our world, a lot of environmental problems, they seem so big, like climate change um, and a lack of mm -hmm. water and things like that. But what we do with our volunteers is give them an action that they can do locally that affects them in their mm -hmm. water locally, that they can do something about the problem. So think globally, act locally. So that's what we're, we're trying to do with all those volunteers. And we need volunteers to help us you know, prevent litter from going in our waterways, help us plant trees to restore that land next to the water because the trees can actually help uh, keep pollution from the water. And, you know, and every time that someone does uh, a volunteer activity, they learn a little bit about 
the waterways. Mm -hmm. So yeah. if our students do a shoreline cleanup and they pick up litter and they see how bad it is that litter is getting in our water, they're not going to litter themselves mm -hmm. and they're going to tell others to not litter. That's what we've, we've had people tell us when our children, you know, have done a cleanup then they're very, they're very apt to go want to do more cleanups and tell people to not litter. So we're kind of trying to cut out that litter at the source. Yeah, so like real world application mm -hmm. and, and they can see how something that they do really has an effect on something much larger than just themselves. It's really important. So um, you've, you mentioned a few of the programs you have for young people. Can you talk about that a little bit and if any of our Buffalo Public School students have an opportunity to participate? Sure. So anybody is always welcome to participate in our our summer sweep that we have going on throughout the summer and actually into the fall this year as we go back into school. And anybody can uh, register with us to get supplies from us and do a cleanup in their local community on their own. And then you can tell us the data from all of the, the litter that you picked up and then we tabulate all that. Um, we also have a program most years with Buffalo Public Schools, our Young Environmental Leaders Program. Um, it's been very successful over the last, uh, since 2013. Um, and we actually had to, unfortunately had to suspend it this year because yeah. of the pandemic, but we're gonna be working um, with our, our administrators and teachers to try to figure out you know, how to implement that last uh, next year. Um, there's lots of opportunities on our website as well. We share lots of information. Um, we have, we're going to have uh, tree plantings and invasive species removal events in the fall, mm. so we can check on our website for that. Okay, so the invasive species, some, similar to what Megan was talking about. Right, so our work uh, connects all through all of these different parks that we're talking about in this segment. Uh, we have a restoration site at, at TIFF Nature Preserve. You know, we're working with Olmstead Parks to work on thinking about restoring this, this beautiful lake behind us, because even though it looks beautiful, there is some pollution you know, on the bottom of it that we need to clean up. And you know, in Broderick Park, you know, we're very involved with the Friends of Broderick Park, um, telling the story of uh, the, the great history of our, our waterways as well. Oh, Chris, thank you so much, and thank you for tying that all in, because it's obvious that the Buffalo Niagara Waterkeeper is connected through, you know, with, within all of our waterways and our, and our beautiful parks. And I thank you for sharing that because it does tie everything in so beautifully. So Chris, thank you for being here and thank you for joining us today. And I'm really excited that our young people will hear your voice about this. And, and thanks for watching everyone and we'll see you next time. Yeah.